All right, everyone, in part six of the lecture series on civil rights and civil liberties, I want to pick up where I left off, looking at the question of what rights do defendants have according to the Bill of Rights. And as you've probably gathered in the first five episodes, the rights that you have are going to be defined by a series of cases tried generally, you know, or that reach the Supreme Court where limits and boundaries are established. So you can do X, but you cannot do Y. You can do Z, but you can't do A. Right. And so we're looking today at the Fourth Amendment and which is the protection from unreasonable search and seizure that officers can't just come onto your house and say, hey, um, I just want to see if you have anything illegal in your house and open the door and come in. We said that the but the courts have ruled that they have police have to present probable cause to a judge in order to secure a warrant. Right. This warrant allows them to search uh, a, a particular uh, place. So you get a warrant for a car, you get a warrant for a garage or you get a warrant for a house. Um, but it must be said, I can't get a warrant if I'm a police officer for I want to search anywhere I feel like um, in order to find this guy. Right. I can't even really get a warrant that says I want to search all seven of, you know, Mr. Weasley's properties. I have to get a warrant that says I am looking for a murder weapon and I'm specifically going to look for it at this house. Moving on, um, it should also be stated that the courts have generally found that it warrants are not applicable in every single circumstance because some cir circumstances don't allow police officers or law enforcement officials the time needed to get one. So searches can be warrantless, uh, but probable cause still must be present. And in order to defend that search in court and not get it thrown out, you have to make a good case that you had probable cause in order to launch that search, right? So probable cause is generally granted when an officer's safety is threatened, if they're being shot at, right, or uh, they're being threatened in any way, then a police officer can, you know, search an entire car or barge into your house without getting a warrant. Um, there's also a, kind of a provision that the courts have established that searches can be warrantless if they believe there is imminent destruction of evidence. So if you are looking for something and you see that, you know, the person whose house you're kind of staking out has built a bonfire in the backyard and brought out two boxes worth of rando stuff that you can't see, the police officer could get out of their house and go directly directly onto the property and start searching um, because there's there's a case to be made that the person was about to burn the evidence that they're looking for. Um, we also have found that searches can be warrantless uh, when we're specifically looking uh, for an item involved in a crime that's in a suspect's possession. So if I pull, if I'm a police officer and I pull somebody over and I'm like looking for a bag of uh, cocaine, right? I can search your vehicle um, as long as I have probable cause in order to find that cocaine without having to go to a judge to get a warrant. Um, I can enter a house as a police officer. I can enter a house without a warrant. Courts have said if um, I have reason to believe someone is inside and seriously injured. So if I hear a scream, right, or if I see, you know, a fight from a window upstairs or I go to knock on the front door of a, a person who I'd like to speak to and I find the door is cracked open and there's blood visible from where I'm standing, I could then go into the house and begin searching immediately without securing a warrant. But... If I stretch any of these or if I act without good faith and that is determined in court that, you know, I made up a scream, that there wasn't an actual scream, but I said there was so I could go in or, you know, I said that I saw uh like blood on a door, but there wasn't one, then any evidence obtained in that illegal manner without probable cause, without an officer's safety being threatened, without a genuine belief that evidence was going to be destroyed, all of that evidence would be subject to the exclusionary rule. And any like decent defense attorney would, would, would invoke a constitutional measure to have that evidence secured through an illegal search thrown out. 
and that has been upheld by the courts. First and the Second Amendment, it's the courts through, through cases establishing exactly how far these relatively vaguely worded civil liberties can be stretched. And so we look at specifically a couple cases that definitely dealt with um, this. And, and the, the case, I think it's on your must-know Supreme Court cases pack, is Map B, Ohio. In this case, uh, you had the police who were searching for a particular, uh, an offender of a violent crime, and entered a house looking for that person. But while on the property of this person who, you know, this was not the, the criminal's house, this was a lady who lived in the neighborhood, who they, I think the story was, they, they charged through her house in pursuit of a, of a criminal. Right. And while they were charging through this house in pursuit of the criminal, uh, one of the officers happened to see in plain sight um, child pornography. And so they when they caught the criminal, they arrested that person. But they then went back to the woman whose house they charged through and they arrested her for possession of child pornography. Again, something that we'd all look at and say, good, I'm glad they got her. But at the same time, it wasn't about the child pornography or anything illegal, it was the, the principle of the matter that they found something through an illegal search. And so Map v. Ohio was the case that applied uh, unreasonable search and seizure and incorporated unreasonable search and seizure limitations to the states. Um, now, if, if we want to talk about recent developments that have impacted the Fourth Amendment, we have to discuss the Patriot Act, passed in the kind of years following 9-11, um, which dramatically increased government powers um, to conduct surveillance against U.S. citizens, both foreign and abroad, to, to tap you know, phone calls and to look at large sets of data coming up from phone companies. And so the Patriot Act has greatly decreased Fourth Amendment protections towards terrorists. And the debate and, and where courts have been involved is, is what impact has this law had on actual citizens, right, who are kind of caught in the crossfires and can anything you know gained through Patriot Act actions be used against them? Kind of in the same way of Map v. Ohio. So now, continuing on, when we're looking at defendants' rights according to the Bill of Rights, a pretty huge part of civil liberties here: protections against the government, uh, protections um, given to citizens from our own governments. We also want to look at the Fifth Amendment, and sometimes you you hear the the Fifth Amendment invoked in in kind of court shows, right? Law and order. Like I plead the fifth. Uh, you know, somebody gets called to the witness stand and you straight up ask somebody, hey, you, I, you just swore in on a Bible. Did you kill this person? Right? Any lawyer worth a damn is going to look at their client and say, you better plead the fifth. Because the Fifth Amendment um, protects people from the right against self-incrimination. And basically, it puts the onus on the government to basically prove your guilt rather than just like pick you up, pick a bunch of random citizens up in a town, bring them forth, swear them in, and I'll ask them a question, did you do it? And then if they say no, and they actually did, you can get them not only for the crime, but then you could charge them with perjury. And so the Fifth Amendment was put in place by the founders of the Constitution to basically prevent that, that, that arresting authorities, whether they're King George or the U.S. government, has a right to prove your guilt, right? Or has a, a not a right, has a responsibility to prove that you are guilty, and they cannot just swear you in and ask you. And so the Fifth Amendment protects against self-incrimination, putting the burden of proof on police and prosecutors to make a case against you, right? And so uh, defendants, if they are asked to provide proof that can be used against them, they have a right to say no, right? They have a right to invoke the Fifth Amendment and say, I can't answer that question. I won't answer that question. I will not provide that piece of evidence. If you want it, get a warrant and then get it. But I am under no obligation to give you anything, right, that could be uh, basically is going to incriminate me. And so sometimes you see prosecuting attorneys offer immunity 
um, in order to get people to waive their Fifth Amendment right. So let's say I picked up a drug dealer um, for dealing drugs on a street corner in Colorado Springs, and I basically say, hey, I know you're not going to say anything because basically you're going to invoke your Fifth Amendment, but um, I will offer you immunity um from prosecution if you tell us everything that you know. So you're going to tell us that you dealt drugs and this is where you got it and all that. So if you tell us all this stuff about you being guilty and where you got the drugs and who you're working for, then we agree not to prosecute you. So I can get you know, to waive your Fifth Amendment protections, but I'm generally going to have to offer something in exchange, right? And so we've also seen, and you see this a lot in cop shows, that there is now um, a, a case, and we're going to talk about it in just a second, that has forced um, police to to inform anybody that they are arresting that of their Fifth and Sixth Amendment rights. And so that is, that's the very famous like Miranda rights, right? And Miranda rights were not guaranteed originally. Like this was not in the Constitution that you have Miranda rights. Miranda rights are, are coming from the case of Miranda v. Arizona, right? There, you now see them in every cop movie or TV show. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you can and will, anything you say can and will be used against you in the court of law. You have the right to talk to an attorney and have them present while you're being questioned. If you cannot afford an attorney, right, one will be appointed to represent you, right? These are Miranda rights. And so the story of this is um, basically Arizona had picked up um, a criminal, um, last name Miranda, I can't remember his first name, but basically had picked up this guy who had a very limited education. I think he had only gone through like the second grade, right? He His English was not great and had arrested him um, for, I, I think the, the offense was a, a fight in a bar the next the the previous night and so they arrested him and basically held him and and kind of coerced a confession out of him um and the problem with it was right that they had never actually told miranda who clearly didn't have the education or the knowledge to know that he had fifth amendment protections against self-incrimination that basically they the police was relying on his ignorance in order to get a confession and so the aclu basically filed suit against the state of miranda or state of arizona and said basically you have a responsibility to inform citizens of their rights right that that we we can't just assume that everybody knows that they have Fifth Amendment protections against self-incrimination. And so as a result of that, Arizona, you better, you should have told Mr. Miranda that he basically had a right not to say anything, right? And he had a right to an attorney. And so now the court ruled yes. They sided with the ACLU and, and defendant Miranda and said, yes, right? Arizona, you did have a responsibility. And so after Miranda v. Arizona, which basically established Miranda rights, if a police officer arrests somebody and does not inform them of their rights, and then somebody confesses without getting their Miranda rights read to them, then basically a mistrial is going to be um, ordered and that person is going to go free. The only exception to this is if there's enough evidence for conviction without defendant testimony. So basically, if there's overwhelming evidence, like I have your DNA, um, let's say it's a rape trial and I have, you know, semen came back and, and you know, it's basically put you there. I found your fingerprints all over the def uh, all over the um the victim's bedroom, right? I found your blood uh, on, like, you cracked a window to get in, and I found your blood right there, right? And then somebody saw you entering and exiting the window that you raped the victim at. Like, if that was the case, then whether or not you were read your Miranda rights and confessed or not, the evidence is so overwhelming for conviction that I could still bring charges. But short of that, a, a mistrial is going to be granted. So that's an incredibly important um, protection established in Miranda v. Arizona. Now, defendants must clearly invoke these rights. So once the Miranda warning is given, they have to say, you have to say, I, I 
don't want to say anything. I'm electing not to talk. I want a lawyer. If you don't, police will continue to testify or question you. We're going to leave off here. We'll pick up in tomorrow.